Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to both of you for being here. Um, I also appreciate your commitment uh, to protecting the rights that we hold dear as Americans and, and our security. This, this issue of encryption cuts right to the heart of a lot of things, it cuts right to the heart of the, uh, the nature of the relationship between the American people and their national government, uh, and to the heart of uh, a number of features in the Constitution, including responsibilities of the federal government to safeguard the people and uh, also to safeguard their rights. I believe it's an issue that Congress and the executive branch have to approach with a great deal of prudence, uh, recognizing that we can't view it exclusively either as a national security issue on the one hand or as a privacy issue on the other hand. Um, uh, we have to view it holistically, uh, uh, understanding that we, we've got to find uh, uh, a resolution to this that respects all the interests at stake. Um, Admiral Rogers, I'd like to start with you. Um, on August 17th, the Washington, uh, Washington Post reported that a cache of commercial software flaws that had been gathered by uh, NSA officials was mysteriously released, um, causing concerns both for government security uh, and also for the security and the integrity of those companies. Uh, who I believe had not been notified by uh, the NSA of the, the flaws uh, discovered in their systems. So can you walk through this process um, uh, with us that the NSA uses to determine... Vulnerability? Uh, yeah, well, to determine when, whether, to what extent um, uh, you should notify a private company of a security vulnerability that you've discovered and, and, and whether NSA will continue to... Um, withhold such information from those companies when uh, w w when you're holding those and there are some clear concerns about the security of um, uh, of your own systems. So there's a vulnerability um, evaluation process interagency that was started in 2014 that we continue to be a part of, whereas NSA and other entities, not just us, become aware of you know zero-day vulnerabilities, so to speak, those vulnerabilities that we don't think our others are aware of that haven't been patched or addressed, that we raise those through an interagency process where we assess What's the impact of disclosing or not disclosing? I have said publicly before, I think over the last few years overall, I think our overall disclosure rate has been 93% or so of the total number of vulnerabilities using this process since 2014. And we continue to use that process. Okay, okay, so you, you do that on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, sir. On the, on the totality of the circumstances. Um, has there ever been an instance in which uh, a U.S. company has suffered a security breach because of a cyber vulnerability that you were aware of, that, you, that NSA had previously identified, but... Uh, I, I can't say totality of knowledge, sir. I, I don't know totality. I apologize. Okay. No, uh, it's understandable. Um, on Sunday, just this, this past Sunday, the Wall Street Journal uh, published a report on the methods of ISIS, the methods that ISIS mm -hmm. is using, in which there were some experts who concluded that um, low-tech communications... Uh, including things like face-to-face -face conversations, handwritten notes, and sometimes the use of burner phones, um, have proven to be just as much of a problem uh, for Western intelligence officials as the use of high-end encryption by our adversaries. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I was wondering if, um, if I could get your sense on this. Are, are the defense and intelligence communities uh, investing enough into human intelligence and other activities to address low-tech terror uh, methods like those leading up to the Paris attacks. And, and if we continue, I, a related question to that is, if we continue focusing on combat, combating highly sophisticated encryption technology, do we expect to see a corresponding shift uh, uh, into these lower tech alternatives? Senator, you're... Uh you, you put your finger on a really important point, which is the um, the need for a really diverse set of uh, intelligence collection um, capabilities and disciplines, uh, capabilities that go after the high end uh, using the best of our technology available, but also capabilities that draw upon um, individual case officers, uh, area expertise, language expertise, um, and presence on the ground in a lot of places around the world where we can, in a very granular way, 
uh, pick up what's going on and and identify threat actors who, uh, as you note, may be, may be using um, relatively unsophisticated mechanisms for uh, planning and plotting uh, attacks against the U.S. homeland and our allies. So. Uh, with, with regard to the aspect of your question around uh, uh, human intelligence, uh, we have been making some investments over the uh, last several years to continue to improve the effectiveness um, and um, capacity of defense-related human intelligence working closely with, uh, with CIA. And I think that, that is a very important set of investments to be making. Senator, can I add one comment? Sure. That would be okay. Um, I think what that article highlights is the fact that we are watching ISIL use a multi-tiered strategy for how they convey information and insight that runs the entire gamut. And so I think for us as intelligence professionals, we've got to come up with a strategy and a set of capabilities that are capable of working that spectrum. It can't be we just spend all our money focused on one thing. I don't think that's a winning strategy for us, if that makes sense. Understood. I Got a couple of other questions, but my time's expired, so I'll, I'll submit those in writing. Thank you very much. Senator Heinrich. 